Voilà, j'enregistre. C'est bon, c'est parti. OK, donc euh, je continue. OK, so uh, I apologize if this is all stuff which is uh, a bit old for you. I sort of only joined the working group about a week ago. And so I just wanted to review uh, the, the very fundamental models that I'm going to be working with uh, in my talk today. Uh, won't take too much time with them, just to sort of put them out there so we're all in agreement on parameters in the model. Uh, so what you're seeing on your screen right now is uh, the SIR epidemic model uh, in a very famous paper by Kermack and McKendrick from 1927. And I just actually want to make the point, it's sort of funny that this paper has been cited about 4,000 times for a set of ODE models in it, whereas their actual interest was a stochastic model, which took up most of the paper, and the ODE model was presented as an approximation, a bit of one of many asides I'll make. So uh, in this particular example that I'm going to, the toy model I want to play with today, I'm, there's going to be no mortality induced by the virus. One can add that into the model. It doesn't change tremendously the analysis that I'm going to show you. It just sort of complicates it. So I wanted to keep the simplest possible model that had the appropriate behavior. Uh, this is a slight variation on uh, an SIR model that many of you might have seen because it has host demography in it. So I'm assuming that there's a population of individuals. Uh, the total population size is n, which is an integer, which is large. And they can be divided into three classes. Uh, and sort of the classes will change over time as the, as the epidemic progresses. They can be susceptible, infected, or recovered. And there's usually a progression. One goes from susceptible to being infected by a contact with an infected individual, and then after a period of being infected and infectious, one recovers and passes the recovered class, at which point one has immunity. Uh, you'll see the little arrows coming out of every box that's immune to just a host mortality. I'm assuming there's a natural background mortality in hosts. And there's an inflow of new susceptibles into the population. They could be either births of new individuals who are susceptible. So we're assuming that you're born with neither, infect, neither infected nor with immunity. And they could also sort of, we can also include the possibility of having immigrants in that incoming category, sort of mu n. And so we're assuming that the number of incoming migrants is proportional to the population size. And that's a simplification that keeps the population size fixed throughout all of this. Let's see here, next page. So what people typically do with these sorts of equations is they pass from this compartmental visual model to a deterministic ordinary differential equation formation, formulation, which I've shown here. And essentially, uh, on each of those arrows, as I saw through the box, those were sort of are interpreted as rates of flow from one state to the next. And then we sort of get this very simple ordinary differential equation. We have an inflow of susceptibles. We have a flow from the susceptible class to the infected class. And we have a flow from the infected class to the recovered class. Now, right now, you sort of see this N throughout. And one of the first things I want to do is pass from talking about individuals to talking about densities rather than absolute numbers of individuals. And that gives me this sort of entirely equivalent system of ordinary differential equations, where now I've passed to talking about the fraction of the population, which is in each of the classes. And you see sort of N has disappeared from this equation. And I'm going to come back to why this is the better way of thinking about it later. But sort of just the first idea to think about here is that ODEs do very well at describing flows of mass. They do very poorly at describing discrete stochastic systems. And what I want to be able to do is think about the ODE in relation to the stochastic system as an approximation in a certain regime. Now, before I go any further, I just want to say that, you know, so obviously this is about the, the simplest possible model of an epidemic. We've seen a lot more complicated modeling already and a lot more complicated biology. And I think we sort of sometimes, you know, we like complicated models, but what we forget is that complicated models have a real deficit in that they are very difficult to fit with data. And I just love this quote here. It's from John von Neumann. He attributed to Enrico Fermi. That's the other way around. With four parameters, I can fit an elephant. And with five, I can make him wiggle his trunk. We have this idea that we sort of, we can basically produce just about any phenomena we want given enough parameters. 
So in some sense, it's best to have a model with very few parameters that really constrains us to sort of, and then we can complicate the model later as needed when we can or cannot predict, you know, phenomena that we observe in nature. And especially I think why it's a very small number of parameters is very important to think about when we're thinking about these SIR models is that often in real epidemic data, especially at the beginning of an epidemic, it's a real challenge to just even estimate a single parameter or not, you know, sort of the, the exponential growth rate of, of. And I just sort of pointed out here at the bottom, uh, this is a paper that came out about a month ago. Uh, my colleagues in this work are all co-authors on this paper. And they point out that when people are fitting or not to the initial phases of the of the COVID epidemic, the, the errors are absolutely huge and people are really underestimating the error that they're making in when they make their estimates. And this is just for a single parameter. So we, you know, they're making the point, we didn't at the beginning of the epidemic have the capacity to reliably estimate one parameter. So let's forget about 10 or 20 parameter models for now. So that's just sort of my first sort of aside of many. So let me come back to that SIR model. Uh, the addition of demography is there because uh, we are interested in modeling the situation, not where we have a single epidemic which ends with the disappearance of the pathogen, but what is observed often in nature, which is that we'll have recurring epidemics. Uh, this is just a simple example where I've simulated uh, those ODEs in uh, Maple, it's a computer software package, with a population of size 100, and uh, the parameters that I've chosen here are parameters that are typical of measles prior to uh, the arrival of the, me the measles vaccine. And you can see that the sort of this pattern of damped of cycles that are recurrent. Now, because I've used the measles data, that leads me to my second aside, which is that the first is to observe that we do actually see these cycles in measles. And on the other hand, uh, it's already sort of a first point of caution in using toy models because the cycles that you see on your screen right now aren't damped cycles. They are anything but, and they also recur about every two years, which is longer than, is, than would have been predicted if we had just used the SIR model that I showed you. Uh, and actually, I'm going to point you to another paper, again, by my colleagues in this work, where they pointed out that actually you can predict uh, from the SIR model with forcing the cycles that you're seeing here and what they are, you know, sort of obviously it's, it's just a hypothesis, but it's one that seems to work quite well, which is that when you allow seasonal forcing based on the fact that uh, students are in and out of the schools on an annual basis, that actually leads to a period doubling bifurcation so that the annual forcing of the, of the school cycle predicts a biannual cycle of measles, which is what the data is actually showing. But I am not going to be talking about forcing or anything quite so complicated today. What I am interested in, though, is the question of when we get the second epidemic or when we have a, what's called fade out of the disease at the end of the first epidemic. So what I'm showing you here is, again, another slide with uh, actual data. Uh, I re it's a very nice data set. It's a small uh, pair of islands where they're actually, we actually have complete numbers for, uh, day by day for, the epide for an epidemic of influenza in 1971. And what you see happening here is a pattern where you have an initial epidemic. And then there's sort of exactly like the SIR model is predicting, you have this period where you have a very low number of infecteds, and then you see a second epidemic emerging. And finally, at the end, you see the sort of the, epi the virus goes extinct and you have a period where sort of, where finally the pathogen is removed, not after the end of the first epidemic, but after a second epidemic. And we have data sets where you might even see two or three. And the question that we got interested in was to ask, could we actually write down an estimate for the probability that the disease would survive the first epidemic, the second epidemic, and so forth, and eventually become endemic. So again, just to repeat stuff that you all know, but I kind of wanted to put us all on the same page at the beginning, is the crucial parameter, of course, for me is going to be the basic reproduction ratio, R0, which is the product 
always is the transmission rate times the duration of infection. And normally sort of what distinguishes it R naught as opposed to R is that we have the initial fraction susceptible. And the way we can interpret this is the number of cases on average that are created by patient zero, the first person who becomes infected with the disease in any community. And what I've shown you down below here is R naught data, uh, R naught numbers for a variety of diseases that are known endemic diseases of humans. Uh, these are R naughts that typically reflect sort of uh, pre vaccination numbers rather than post vaccination numbers. And uh, what you're seeing here, and I want to call your attention to, is that for the diseases that I've listed on this thing, you notice that R tends to be you know, sort of, we have four to seven, five to seven. So there seems to be this four and above range in which we see many of the values of R naught. Uh, by contrast, uh, the common cold has an R naught, which is approximately just a bit larger than one. Uh, we're estimating that for COVID, uh, the R naught is sort of in the absence of health interventions is around two. And, you know, other diseases, sort of influenza seems to be about 1.4, 1.7. But sort of we seem to be sort of have one cluster which is around one and a second cluster which is larger values of R naught, uh, you know, sort of, of, of five, six, seven and above. I want you to keep that in mind because I want to come back to that later. So I said uh, my interest today is in talking about uh, fade out probabilities. Uh, the probability that we see after the initial epidemic, the disease goes extinct. And I always forget that I will refer to over and over again, my colleagues, often by name, Ben, Jonathan, and David. Uh, here's what they look like. Uh, they're all in the infectious disease laboratory at McMaster University. Uh, ben is a statistician. David is, math, is a mathematician in dynamical systems. And Jonathan is uh, a bit of a wonderkind who does math and biology. And it's sort of, they're sort of the people I've been working with on this particular project and a few other related projects. So what got us interested in this work originally sort of, you know, a few months ago before it became an important public health question was trying to understand why we saw this pattern in the R naught values and if some simple mathematical modeling could answer it. And it's a puzzle that people have talked about in the infectious disease literature. We can use that, those ODE models that I showed you and you can do some simple calculations, some simple asymptotics that show you that approximately e to the minus r naught individuals remain susceptible at the end of an epidemic. Now, you know, for example, in the case of r naught is equal to two, that means that only about 20% of the population will remain susceptible. When r naught is three, it becomes 5%. And as r naught gets larger and larger, that becomes a diminishingly small fraction of the population that remains susceptible. And for example, if I use the measles data, what we see is that we would expect that less than one in a billion individuals would remain susceptible at the end of, at the, end of the first epidemic outbreak, uh, which suddenly leads us with a bit of a paradox because we have all these diseases which have large values of R naught. I said uh, measles is estimated between 12 and 18, sometimes higher. Uh, there are other diseases, um, coming to mind sort of, for example, if I look at uh, malaria, we estimate R naught that could be as high as 40 or even 100. And so we have a situation where we have large values of R naught lead to a large and fast progressing first epidemic, which is going to eliminate the large, the mass majority of the susceptibles. So it seems unlikely that we would have persistence for these large values of R naught. And so the question we wanted to ask was, how can we explain using simple mathematical models wh why we see this pattern of either very low values of R naught or very high values of R naught? So let me bring us back to this first slide that I showed you of the SIR epidemic model, this compartmental model. Now I want to take the same picture and reinterpret it differently. Uh, previously, I thought of these as being flows of mass in an ordinary differential equation setting. Now I wanna think about this as a discrete stochastic process. 
where I now am talking about the number of individuals as being discrete and finite. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, all individuals are going to be assumed to be identical to each other. Uh, so I'm not in taking into account age classes, vaccinated classes. These are all things that we can do, you know, with a bit more work. It complicates the picture, and I want to keep things simple for today. Those rates now, what I want to think about them is not as flows of mass, but rather as probabilistic rates. So what I mean is that if I discretize time and I take a very small time step of delta t, then, for example, the probability of an individual dying in a time step of length delta t is mu times delta t. So mu, uh, these rates are giving me the probability per unit time of an event happening. Uh, an equivalent way of thinking about them, it's mathematical equivalent, is that there is an exponentially distributed amount of time between events. These are giving me the rates of those exponential distributions. And I can imagine them like clocks, where basically there's, you know, each individual has a death clock that rings after an exponentially distributed amount of time with, with exponential rate mu. So that means that on average, that one on mu is the expected length of time between, before that clock rings. And at the end, when that clock rings, an event happens. So essentially, these are now probabilistic rates describing, either you can think about them as parameters in an exponential distribution or as probabilities over small time steps. Again, so that's sort of what I want to think about this now. And I want to think about this really as n being a discrete integer, but large, because I want to take a, pop a large population limit in order to derive conclusions. So again, sort of my sort of third aside here is what I want to do is I'm say a few technical points about the Markov chains that I'm working with here. My apologies to those of you who already do probability statistics, this is quite boring for you. But I want to think about this right now as, as a continuous time Markov process. Uh, so the Markov property crucially is that it's memoryless in the sense that I only need to know the current state in order to predict the next state of the process. So you can imagine there's a past that stretches back and that it's very easy to imagine more complicated processes that can depend on the entire past and in fact, we can do stochastic models that depend on their entire past. But they're much more complicated to analyze. So I'm going to take, again, sort of continuing on this theme of keeping things as simple as possible. I'm going to assume that knowing one moment in time allows me to predict the next event in time and that the entire history can be summed up by the current state. Now, as I said, sort of these Markov chains are entirely described by the initial state of the process, which we allow to be random and a set of jump rates. And again, as I said before, these are probabilities per unit time of events happening. And so this is sort of, whenever I talk about things in general, I'm going to use Q, X, Y to indicate the probability of jumping from state X to state Y in a small amount of time, T. And J will sort of, will the notation I'll use for the jump size. Now, in this formulation, just to sort of write down some more equations, the jumps that I have possible in the Markov chain that I've described you are basically I can have an arrival of a new susceptible at rate mu n. I can have the death of a susceptible individual at rate mu s. I can have an individual who is susceptible comes into contact with an individual who's infected, resulting in an infection of the susceptible individual, increasing the total number of infected by one. And I can have the possibility of either a death or recovery of an infected individual, which then removes them from the epidemic. As, and so right now you notice that I, I've, I've left out the R's from this picture because essentially because I know that S plus I plus R is equal to N, it's sufficient to look at S and I in order to have a complete description of the epidemic. And so I can think about rather than R's being the recovered class, I can think of just individuals being removed from the epidemic in the sense that either you're immune or you're dead, but one way or the other, you're not part of the epidemic anymore. And just sort of, while I'm looking at those rates again, what we call the transmission term there is called a mass action term. What I'm assuming is a very, very simple model of transmission, which is that individuals make contacts at random uniformly with every other individual in the population. They do that at a constant rate. And essentially what you're seeing that rate there becomes sort of S times I 
times beta on n. What we can think about that as being is that so I have my I have a total number, I have contacts at rate one. If I'm a susceptible individual, I pick an individual at random to have contact with, uh, with probability i, the number of infected individuals divided by the total population size. I'm going to pick someone who's infected to have my contact with. And beta then becomes the probability that, I, that there's a transmission that occurs in that contact. This is a simple mass action idea that everyone is potentially interacting with everyone else. Again, uh, one can do, and there's a lot of very nice work on either putting these models onto networks. So you're allowed to have contact only with your immediate neighbors. It's also very nice work, which I think is actually much more relevant, which is using households where you assume that you have small groups of individ uh, smaller groups where you can have contact within the smaller group uniformly and then there's a, a, a much lower rate of contact between groups uh, you know sort of uh, frank ball has done a lot of very nice work on that sort of model i want to keep it simple today and i said now this is already sort of a, a ridiculously simple model but uh, for those of you who were here a couple weeks ago for Dirk's talk, uh, you saw a lot about the idea of the master equation, a chemical master equation, as being a tool for analyzing these sorts of systems. And the fact is, is that already for this toy model that I'm showing you, that, that master equation does not have an analytical solution. It's still possible to obviously numerically evaluate it, but it's, you know, we can't solve it. And in general, any process of just about any complexity doesn't have an analytically tractable master equation. They're useful as a theoretical tool. We can use them to prove existence of Markov chains, prove uniqueness of Markov chains. But what we often want to do to analyze them is to, much like when we're looking at ordinary differential equations or partial differential equations, we, we use linearization as a way of simplifying the problem I want to sort of deploy a set of other tools, more suited to stochastic processes that allow me to simplify this process and look at sort of, in sort of approximating processes that are going to capture the essential behavior in an analytically tractable way because I can't deal with the whole system analytically. This is my next aside. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide. It's more here for the benefit of people who are interested in really getting their hands into this sort of modeling. So the process that I've just shown you for the SIR with those rates is an example of a class of processes that are called density dependent population processes. Uh, this class of processes was first identified by Tom Kurtz in 1970. He was primarily interested in chemical reaction equations like we saw a couple of weeks ago and he proved in a series of papers from about 1970 to 1980, a, a large number of results about density popula dependent population processes, which really are just incredibly useful tools in attacking these kinds of problems. And the reason is because this class includes the SIR model that I've shown you. It includes many, many problems of biological interest. It includes the class of chemical reaction equations. It's been applied in many places and it's, so it has this nice virtue of being both a very general class of models, but also one for which one can prove nice theorems and have general results. Uh, what makes them a density dependent population process is exactly this idea that the rates don't depend on the absolute number of individuals, but only on their densities. And I remind you the density, you know, when I talk about numbers, I'm talking you know, sort of counting individuals. When I talk about densities, I'm talking about the number of individuals divided by n, so the fraction of the population. Uh, one does not have to assume that the population size is fixed in order to use this framework. It's just a simplifying assumption I've made in this case. And in fact, a lot of the most interesting thing happen when we don't allow the population size to be fixed, but rather use, rather than as a parameter, the absolute size of the population, we use it as sort of the order of magnitude of the population. And so again, so this idea again, sort of that what makes it a density dependent population process is that the rates only depend on the densities up to the fact that they're multiplied by this scaling factor n. And to go back to my slides before, what you're seeing here is if I were to rewrite these in terms of the densities, what I would have sort of, you know, sort of n times uh, mu, sort of mu is independent of the density. I could write the rate of death as mu times n times the density. So again, it's n times something independent, which depends only on the densities and so forth. And again, uh, sort of the first result, 
And one of two results that I want to use today about this class of processes is in that original paper by Kurtz. Uh, there's a bunch of technical conditions here that I'm not really that concerned about. What I want to just emphasize is this statement right here, which is that he describes a formula by which you can go from those rates. Uh, here, j is the size of a jump, and lambda is the rate at which the jump j occurs. And so basically, I, sum, I take a sum, this is now sort of a vector valued function in general. I take a sum of the rates multiplied by the size of the corresponding jumps, and this gives me a function. And this is a, gives us a vector field, and the vector field is actually describing an ordinary differential equation. And we get this statement, and I'm not sure what's happened there, uh, which is that, yeah, which is that as I take the population size to infinity, over I can take the supremum over finite time intervals of the density. So this is now sort of not the absolute number of individuals, but the number of individuals divided by n minus the solution to that differential equation. And the whole thing converges to zero. And this is sort of almost sure convergence. So it's basically the strongest sort of convergence that's possible for a stochastic process. What this says is that with probability one, if I look at the rescaled variables with the population is large enough, they're going to, they're going to collapse down onto the solution of a differential equation sort of with in the supremum norm over finite time intervals. The second result that Kurtz showed is a central limit theorem now for these sorts of processes. And just what, and what we say with central limit theorem is we're saying that there's basically a Gaussian approximation to the correction or the error in that approximation. And again, uh, ignore the technical details. The important part is that we can explicitly write down here, it's a stochastic differential equation for an ornstein ohlenbeck process. It's about the next simplest sort of stochastic process after Brownian motion. And what, it's, and what the result says is that I can take the densities from my stochastic process and they look to first order, like the ordinary differential equations that I, I, that I can derive directly from the rates plus an explicitly describable correction, which is uh, a diffusion correction. And the error on that is one on root n. So basically scales that correction. And then the remaining error turns out to be of order log n on n. So we've got very nice sort of description of a deterministic approximation, a Gaussian correction to the deterministic approximation, and then a bound on the error in making that approximation. So this again sort of uh, is a very useful set of theorems. This is sort of the, the first of many follow-up papers by Tom Kurtz where he describes sort of how we sort of get the correction terms after the ordinary differential equation approximation. Now I can apply Kurtz's theorem to my model. And what it's saying is that when I look at the densities for the Markov chain, so now this is the Markov chain SN IN here, looking at their densities, as I take n to infinity, they're going to behave like the solutions to the original Kermack and McKendrick differential equations that I, that I had at the very beginning. Now, what I want to emphasize here, because it's going to be what I'm going to use as the transition to my next uh, step, is that the initial conditions that I have to take for in order to pass through these differential equations, uh, it's kind of an obvious statement. I've seen it, uh, my apologies, an error here, that should be a zero here and a zero here. But what I'm basically taking is the initial density in the limit of the stochastic process, which I'm assuming to be known, or at least something I can characterize as the initial conditions of the differential equations. But you'll notice that once I have made this step here, I've implicitly assumed that I already have on the order of N infected individuals at the beginning of the epidemic. And that's where the sort of ordinary differential equation approximation starts to fall down is because epidemics don't start off with 10% of the population infected. They start off with one individual being infected. And that's outside of the domain of applicability of not merely the differential equation approximation, but even the higher order corrections that I showed you on the previous slide. So although these ordinary differential equations are going to be useful to us once the epidemic is underway, 
they don't describe what happens at the beginning of the epidemic and they don't describe what happens at the end of the epidemic. So we need to find another approximation in order to deal with those, those phases. And in some ways, those are the phases that are most interest to us, both from a public health point of view and you know, from the probabilistic point of view. That's where you know, stochasticity matters and it, what's the size, whether or not you, know, you have an initial takeoff, whether you have a second epidemic or not. So as I said, really when an epidemic starts, there is maybe one infected individual, maybe a handful of infected individuals to arrive in the community. And so when I take the limit of the initial number of infected individuals divided by n as n goes to infinity, I'm getting zero as my initial condition in those differential equations. So essentially I've just lost the infected altogether from the population process. And I've only got a description of the susceptibles as if there was no epidemic at all. And that gives me this equation right here. Now, in fact, nice equation, I can write down sort of very simply write down a solution to that equation. And this might seem to be completely useless to us because we've simply wiped out the number of infected altogether, but it's going to turn out that this equation plus a second approximation is going to give us an excellent approximation to the number of infecteds that's going to be analytically tractable as well. And that second approximation is uh, sort of the perhaps fundamental toy of stochastic processes, what's called the birth and death process. And in this particular case, it's a branching birth and death process, which is about the simplest object one could ask for because it's one of the few objects that can be completely characterized. Uh, so what a birth and death process postulates is that I have a population that starts off with some finite number of individuals. Those individuals are allowed to give birth to a single offspring. So we have here sort of our ancestor here, a fir first event here is a birth. Then there's the amount of time that progresses. This individual gives birth this offspring dies, this one persists. And so actually, and so the, the birth death possibilities, we simply have two possibilities for each individual. They can either give birth or die at sort of rates which are either dependent on time or independent of time. The branching aspect here is that I'm going to assume that individuals, once they're born, are independent of their siblings. So in this case, I could look at this part of the branching of the birth and death process of the branching process and it's a branching process on its own with this ancestor governed by the same laws as the as the process the same is true here so I can essentially treat this part of the branching process here the offspring the descendants of the first offspring or the descendants of the second offspring as independent branching processes the same is true if I started here and considered you know, sort of this line here is an independent process of this process and so on and so forth. Now, what I want to do is use a birth and death process to describe the number of infected individuals. Now, if we went back a few slides, what I said when I described the rate of production of new infections was that I had this mass action term that was beta times S times I divided by N so I want to do is think about now beta times S divided by N is the rate per individual infected at which they give rise to new cases. Now, that's sort of what I'm, so that's sort of what I'm thinking, sort of going from thinking about a population level sort of where we're creating infected from infected. Now we'll think about the individual rate at which infected create new infected. And what I'm going to do here is take the approximation that what I said was that Sn divided by n was well approximated by that differential equation. So the heuristic basically is I'm going to replace the Markov chain here, density, by the solution to the differential equation. And what I've done here now is created a rate of production of new infecteds that depends only on a differential equation that I can solve and not on the number of infected. So I've essentially I have broken any relation between the infected and turned them into a branching process. Uh, again, in this case, sort of when I say birth death, obviously birth now is the production of a new infected. 
Same thing here, when an individual dies or becomes or recovers, that's essentially a death in this branching process. And I can think of this occurring at a per capita rate of gamma plus mu. And what it turns out, and I'll just sort of sketch for you in the next slides how we would prove this, but this approximation is a rigorously provable approximation, which says that so long as the, we're only interested in the initial phase of, of the epidemic, or whenever the number of infected is very rare, that this approximation holds and we can use it to approximate the number of infected individuals. How would we prove that? Uh, the way we do it is a technique uh, that was developed uh, by Dublin here in France in the 1940s. It's called coupling. And what I do essentially is I want to compare my stochastic process. So in this case, it's my number of infected with the simplified branching process that I described on the previous slide. And the way I'm going to do that is I create branching processes that are designed so that they jump at more or less, this, essentially their, their jumps are subsets of one another in such a way that I'm going to have a lower bound branching process, which is always smaller than the true number of infected individuals. And I'm going to have an upper bound branching process, which is always greater than the number of infected individuals. And they're going to be, these two processes are going to be de determined here by these equations. You can see I need to give myself, because S is an approximation and not the true number of, you know, sort of, the actual thing here is a stochastic quantity, Sn divided by N. So I give myself an epsilon of room, sort of allowing one process to have epsilon greater than the, the approximation I'd like to make one epsilon smaller. That epsilon of room is going to allow me to sort of make this comparison. Now, and this statement here is a statement, uh, it's a pathwise statement. So what I mean by that is that I'm actually imagining that I'm creating instances of each of these stochastic processes. And for each instance of the stochastic process, I, have, I can generate one example of the branching process here, one example of the infection process, and one example of the upper process of the similarities. And they're always going to, this relation is going to be true for all time for that, that instance. And I can construct these in such a way that this is true for every time I do this. And what this, the reason it's sort of useful to have this comparison here is that if this is a lower bound on the number of infected, then if that becomes, if that becomes large, then the number of infected becomes large. And similarly with the upper bound, if this goes extinct, then the pathogen goes extinct. And the reason that I'm interested in these things up to epsilon n is not just because I can only prove it up to epsilon n, but because Remember what I said about the ordinary differential equations is that they became applicable once I had a positive fraction of the population in the infected class. So essentially what we're saying here is this branching process approximation fails exactly when I'm allowed to start using the ordinary differential equation approximation. So I can use this to sort of fill in the gaps in the times when I then use the other approximation when this approximation fails. And just to illustrate how one actually constructs those processes is essentially I generate potential bursts and potential deaths with the fastest possible rate. So the fastest possible birth rate was, this was the maximal birth rate in the, in the upper process. I generate, this is the largest process. So basically the most individuals times the fastest rate gives me the fastest possible production of new births. Similarly, I have the rate of death and I take the largest number of individuals of all three processes and I generate events at this rate, call them death events. And all I do is that at each point, I generate these potential births and potential deaths. I'm going to make the potential births and the potential deaths the, actual events in the largest process. And then I take a subset of those events to create my infected process and a subset of those events to create the smaller branching process in such a way that the rates, so essentially this is what I'm generating here, this rate here 
When I multiply this rate by the probability of success, I get the rate for the infected process. And similarly, when I multiply this rate by the rate, by this probabilistic factor, I get the rate for the slow process. So what I'm basically doing is I'm thinning. I'm tossing away events that aren't applicable in the smaller events. But I'm always sort of, at this point, sort of, whenever there's a birth in the smallest process, there must be a birth in the true number of infected process, and there must be a birth in the upper bound process. And I do the same thing for deaths. So basically, I, I construct the deaths at the largest possible rate, and I say that if I can sort of, when I kill an individual in the, in the smallest process, I must kill the same individual in the middle process, and I must kill the same individual in the top process. And in this way, I have basically created all three stochastic processes at once, preserving that order relation. So that's how we, and this is sort of how we prove these results. It's sort of a sketch of this. And uh, the one thing I'm going to sweep into the rug is that basically the, the work that has to be done is just to show that the Kurtz theorem, which only applied on finite time intervals, you just have to do a bit more work in order to show that, that you can extend that from finite time intervals to inter time intervals of, of length log n. And that log n is long enough then to to sort of get you out of the realm where the branching process approximation is no longer valid into the realm where the ordinary differential equation approximation is valid. So what have I gained by moving to this, this birth and death process approximation? It turns out I've gained exactly what I didn't have in the original process, which was the ability to analytically solve the master equation. Uh, this was done in a paper in 1948 by Kendall, where if I assume a general birth and death process with time dependent birth rates and time dependent death rates, which is exactly what I was using to approximate my epidemic process, then I can explicitly write down the master equation for that. I can solve the master equation. I can solve the probability of extinction. I can solve the, prob the complete probability distribution is available in this Kendall paper. So I have a complete description of this process. In particular, I have an expression. It's not the prettiest expression ever, but it gives us an expression for the probability that in finite time, the branching process goes extinct. In particular, sort of this criteria, this, if this integral diverges, then the process will go extinct at some finite time. And one of the properties of branching processes is they either go extinct at a finite time or they grow indefinitely and will we continue increasing without end. And so what that means for my process is when I'm thinking about epidemics is that either the process goes extinct in the branching phase and the epidemic is over or my branching process grows without limit, which says that my infected processes are growing until I hit the boundary where the branching process approximation is no longer valid and I can then move into my other approximation. Uh, when I apply that here uh, to the model that I'm showing you, I get this result here. What I've done is I've plugged in the rates. I'm using S of T, as I said, the, the solution that I gave to the ordinary differential equation describing the susceptibles with no infected. And this is the, this is the version of that formula by Kendall's that, I, uh, Kendall's that I showed you previously using the rates. So here we see the death rate is the sum of the recovery rate plus the death rate of individuals this is this approximate rate of production of susceptibles. And my expression now depends on the number of infected at time i0. Uh, not going to do this for you. If I were to look at this at the very beginning of the outbreak, then I'm assuming that essentially all but one individual is, is susceptible. So n minus 1 and n goes to 1 is n goes to infinity. So the fraction is asymptotically 1 who, that is susceptible at the beginning of the and I start off with one infected, you can literally just plug that into all these equations and solve that expression exactly to get one minus one on R. So this is now using R naught, not as a criteria for whether or not we see an epidemic occurring, but now a probabilistic description of the probability that you see a branching process that grows indefinitely rather than one that, that goes extinct in finite time. What I'm going to, what I want to do now is use the same result here, not at the beginning of the epidemic, but at the end of the epidemic in order to characterize the possibility of passing to a second epidemic event. 
it turns out uh, you can actually exactly solve that expression. I'm not going to show you the details, but essentially I, I can plug in this S here. I can do all the integrals here and I get this expression, which is a complete analytic description of the probability starting now, not from the initial start, not from S, a fraction, one of the population being initially susceptible and one infected, but rather an arbitrary fraction of the population initially susceptible and an arbitrary number of individuals initially infected, where again, sort of when I say arbitrary, we have to understand that this has to be small relative to N for this approximation to hold. Not, so let's just sort of move on from here. This can show sort of what's nice about branching processes. You can really do a lot with them analytically. So the question is, how can I turn this into saying something about this probability of persistence, which I define as the probability of surviving the end sort of, we have this curve where the epidemic becomes large, almost all the susceptibles are gone. Do we see an extinction of the pathogen at the end of the epidemic or do we see a second epidemic? This, that's what I call the probability of persistence. What I need to do is identify what is the correct initial condition to use that expression, not to describe the start of the epidemic, but the end of the first epidemic. And the way I'm going to do that, again, is to remind you, I have my ordinary differential equations. They are giving me up to higher order corrections, the size of the stochastic process at certain times. And so what I'm going to do is imagine that I'm going to shoot the solution forward of my ordinary differential equations from time zero, where I start off at the point where everyone is susceptible. And I shoot to the first time that I hit a distance delta of zero at the end of the epidemic. Well, maybe sort of, I think I've got a picture on one of the next slide, on the next slide here to make this more clear. But what I'm going to do is, is find the, as I want to find the time and the value of the number of susceptibles where I have some fraction delta N remaining where delta is small remaining infected. And I'm going to use that as initial condition in the expression that I showed you on the previous slide to characterize the probability that this branching process does not go extinct before it escapes again to have a second epidemic. Yeah, so here we go. Here's my picture. So again, I said I'm starting off here. Uh, these are the ordinary eventual equations. This is my initial phase. There's a branching process approximation here. Assuming that it's gotten, that it's escaped with probability one minus one on R naught, we're going to have this phase where it's going to be to follow this curve of the differential equation all the way down here to the other end here where the number of infected gets small again. And it's here that I can no longer reliably use the ordinary differential equation approximation anymore. So I want to make the transition here to the branching process approximation again. Here, again, I've sort of, this is my initial condition at this point here. What I need to do is identify a point here, which I'm going to use as the initial, as a starting point for my second approximation. Again, can't actually solve these analytically, even these simple ordinary differential equations. So at this point, uh, we can either just use numerical solutions or because I like doing things analytically. I'm just going to show you in the next couple slides how we can just get some analytical approximations to the curves that turn out to be wonderf uh, wonderfully accurate, uh, much more than better than we expected, that are going to allow us to analytically characterize the behavior at this point and thus sort of really sort of analytically characterize the probability of, of persistence in the system. Uh, the way I'm going to do that is by using a very classic technique of ordinary differential equation analysis uh, that have matched asymptotic approximations, which was a technique uh, really developed by Henri Poincaré about a century ago. And it's sort of fallen out of favor, but I think it's still sort of just a wonderful tool. And what I need to do is have a small parameter in my ordinary, now sort of n is my parameter for my stochastic analysis. One on n is my small parameter for stochastic analysis. I need a small parameter for my deterministic analysis. And for that, I'm going to use the, the mortality rate of, of hosts. Now, people have an extremely low mortality rate. Uh, we die at you know, sort of our 
probability sort of when you compute it as 0.02 per year is the death rate in humans. So five times five to the minus five is the daily death rate for people. And that's going to be sort of, I'm going to treat that as a small parameter with the analyzed ordinary differential equations. So if I do that, and in fact, this is what uh, Kermack and McKendrick did in their 1927 paper, is I can write down not the original system of differential equations. Remember before I had di, dt, and ds, dt, but I wanted to now look at the phase portrait of that, which is what I showed you in this slide here. This is an equation describing the phase portrait. And if I assume that mu is small, then this simplifies out to something which is solvable analytically. And again, this is in the original Kermack and McKendrick paper, is we can get an approximation for the number of infected individuals as a function of the number of susceptibles. And again, as I said, for large values of n, we take this as our initial condition. And provided that we're not in the realm where the number of susceptibles is increasing again at the end of an epidemic, you'll notice it's sort of, in these equations I've shown you, there's basically the number of susceptibles is constantly decreasing, so it eventually hits zero. Whereas in the actual equation, sort of in the actual system, we have this increase again. This approximation works well until that until you see an increase in the number of susceptibles again. We can use it very well to predict the number, the maximum size of the epidemic, and it works uh, reasonably well for actual data. Here I'm using uh, mu, which is much larger than the actual uh, true mu because my computer program did very bad at drawing the pictures for the actual value of mu for a population of size 10 to the six and R naught of two sort of, you know, sort of as being the number which is posited for COVID-19. And we see this sort of, as I said, it, the approximation does quite well until we see this turnover where we see recovery susceptibles because this approximation is assuming that there is no inflow of new susceptibles. Now, what we can do uh, to get a, a second approximation is down here in the boundary, we use what are called boundary layer approximations. I'm going to write it down. You essentially move from the original, excuse me, you move from the original equation now to looking at a rescaled version of the equation. I substitute that into the equation I showed you and I get a reduced differential equation that I can solve to obtain, again, an analytic solution for the behavior now of the ordinary differential equation in this part down here. And this is basically going to allow us to then sort of get a characterization of knowing what the behavior of the, of the differential equation is like at the bottom. What we do then is we solve the equation from Kermack and McKendrick. Sorry, I'm having a bit of trouble with slides here. I can solve this equation to determine where I re end with sort of, this is gonna give me my initial condition for this point where down at the bottom. So again, I solve those Kermack and equations in practice, we use the corrected version in order to get an approximation of this point, which we then use, can use as an initial condition for the next, for this equation. And we get just fabulously good approximations to this next phase of the epidemic. So essentially what I say is, so these sort of, I have to say that actually the one thing that we haven't yet done is, uh, we haven't proved that this approximation works as well as it does uh, you know, we've been able to find that we get errors on the order e to the minus 100, so we're not complaining, but we haven't proven that yet. It's the one thing, reason why I haven't submitted this paper yet. Now, what I want to do then is sort of is that sort of, again, the OD approximations would allow me to characterize the point in which I'm allowed to start using my branching approximation at the end of the epidemic. Now, to sort of finish telling the story that I started off with, let me sort of explain, sort of see how this is going to explain those R values that we saw as being either clustered around one or greater than four or five. If I use the expressions that I showed you, I can explicitly compute the probability of persistence as a function of the R naught and as a function of the duration of the infectious period of the pathogen. Uh, what I'm showing you here uh, on, the, the on the vertical axis is the, is, axis is the probability that the, the this strain survives the end of the first epidemic in order to create, a, in order to start a second epidemic. Uh, it's not very clear here, but all of these uh, down here, R equals one, all of these curves are sort of 
going down very extremely rapidly to zero, but once we're a bit larger than one, they shoot up very rapidly. So to explain what each of these curves, each curve is showing you as a function of R naught, according to the average number of days of the infectious period, uh, with the infectious period getting longer as I move from right to left. Uh, two days infectious is even visible on the, on the, on the graph. Uh, this is the curve for a four day infectious period, a six day infectious period, and so on and so forth. Over here with a 20 day infectious period. And we see sort of two trends here. The first is, is that the longer the infectious period, the higher the probability overall of surviving to start a second epidemic. The second thing that we observe is exactly what we saw in the numbers of R0, which is that there is, when R0s are large, so large r naughts give you a very high probability of surviving the initial, sort of the initial epidemic and starting a second epidemic, and r naught is very close to one, give you a very high probability of surviving this fade out event and starting a second epidemic. Whereas in the zone two to four, we see that there's a much lower probability, especially as the infectious period gets shorter of surviving to start a second epidemic. Uh, so we were obviously very pleased when we saw this figure because as I told you at the very beginning and why I said remember this is that we had diseases which either had r naughts bigger than four or r naughts that were close to one. And this is what we're predicting in this very simple mathematical model. Uh, one thought I want to add here is I'm not sure whether this is a good news story or a bad news story for COVID-19 uh, with all the caveats that this is a much oversimplified model because uh, if, remember, we sort of see that the infectious period of COVID-19 is around 14 days. So that's, I guess, this curve right here. And the R-naught is around two. So if we left everything alone, uh, our model predicts that COVID-19 would very likely disappear at the end of the first epidemic. I mean, this is, of course, with tremendous loss of life, which we would like to avoid. So the good news story is, is that it, sort of, if we did nothing, although there would be horrible human consequences, we predict that there's a relatively little chance of seeing a second epidemic of COVID-19. However, the bad news story is that if, we if by our quarantine measures, we fail to bring r not below one, but bring it very close to one, then we risk resulting in a second epidemic of COVID-19 later on. So I think it's sort of an important cautionary, you know, so again, it's, it's a simple model, but we really have to be very, very diligent about getting r not below one, because if we get it close to one, but not below one, we have a strong chance of seeing a second epidemic. So let me just sort of explain why we're seeing this pattern, because it's actually a really, really simple answer and what I'm showing you on this slide is the, simply the, the minimum number of infected individuals in the ordinary differential equations, not the stochastic model. But what you're seeing is that for all the strains, and again, now what we're seeing is sort of this progression is the, the length of the infectious period increases as I go from bottom to top. And what you're seeing is that, but again, if you want to max, if from the virus's point of view, the virus's goal is to maximize its minimum. Our goal is, of course, is to minimize its, is to basically minimize its minimum. But from the virus's point of view, it can maximize its minimum number by either having a very long infectious period or by having either an r out very close to one or an r out that's very large. And that's quite intuitive because this peak here is occurring because when R0 is small, the infection, the fraction of the susceptibles remains quite large. You have a small infection. There's always a supply of susceptibles for the infection to persist in. In the large R0 range, there are very few susceptibles left at the end of the epidemic. But on the other hand, there are among the individuals who are remaining, there are very few susceptibles, but there are still infected remaining when the population size is very small. 
So in other words, a very small R0 or a very large R0 are the two strategies by which you can maintain an infected population in basically that sort of never gets too small. Why is that important? Is that if you look at this expression here and what's happening is that the probability here is depending not on the number of susceptibles that I see right now, but the number of susceptibles discounted over the entire future. And so what a virus's best strategy then to do is, it's not, a, essentially, by the time you've gotten to the end of the epidemic, the number of susceptibles is starting to recover. Uh, their numbers are increasing, they're increasing exponentially fast. So if there are surviving infected, if there are infected individuals at the end of the epidemic, they are seeing a, a massive increase in the number of susceptibles available to them in the future, which is thus giving them the opportunity to sort of ride, you know, ride the rising tide and essentially take advantage of the increasing susceptibles to start a second epidemic. So the, essentially this is the idea. So what's happening is that the, the R0 maximization works. Although you have very few susceptibles with large R0, you, you still have infected individuals. Those infected individuals get to take advantage of the increasing number of susceptibles at the end of the epidemic. Again, obviously, uh, this is the last I want to say about this, but you know, the, uh, this obviously is based on a toy model. There are lots of complications. Uh, in real models, and you know, we need to be analyzing this more carefully, but this at least is a story that makes sense to us and is consistent with a mathematical model that we can derive. Uh, so now it's been an hour, so maybe I should ask, uh, this is sort of one of two places where I can stop, or I can maybe say a few words about evolution before I finish, so maybe I'll just sort of ask you your opinion. Uh, okay, maybe we can have a, a few questions for, for the moment. Uh, and then uh, you can continue uh, a little bit. Uh, okay. Donc, uh, s'il y a des, des questions, je vous demande de lever la main pour prendre la parole les uns après les autres. Ok, okay. je prends les questions en français aussi. Si tout le monde, c'est plus facile pour moi d'expliquer des choses en anglais. Oui. Uh, donc, uh, qu'est-ce que... Uh, qu Il y a, qu y a des questions Alors, moi, moi j'en ai quelques-unes, euh, j'en ai quelques-unes des questions, bien évidemment, à moins qu'il y en ait qui se... Amaury, tu, tu, tu ouais. as... Oui, ouais. je posais une, une question, enfin, qui est vraiment, es, qui est très simple, enfin, d'un point de vue euh, biologique. Hein, euh, ah oui, euh, tout à fait, Amaury, ah, oui. Donc, ça, si c'est bon, c'est une chose qui est très bête, parce que, pour ce moment, on n'a plus... Euh... Euh, donc, on, on suppose qu'il n'y a que les infectés qui sont euh, là au départ, et puis, euh, oui, c'est tout à fait, donc... Oui, c'est ce que je veux faire. Donc, euh, donc ça, c'est vraiment euh, les premiers. Euh, ouais. C'est-à-dire, dès qu'on premiers... c'est quand même dès qu'on rétablit, euh, si on commence à rétablir euh, les connexions. Oui, ouais, tout à fait. Ouais, 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 entre ouais. pays, euh, on va avoir ce gros problème, ouais, c'est ça, de, de, de nouvelles conditions initiales, quoi, qui ne sont pas celles de la précédente épidémie, mais qui sont celles des épidémies. Euh, oui, 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 tout à fait. Donc, oui, oui, oui c'est vraiment ça. Je dis, donc, c'est vraiment. Euh, c'est vraiment. C'est un modèle qui est très simple et bête, euh, mais euh, les c'est. Pour nous, c'est un départ pour comprendre des choses qui sont plus compliquées plus tard. Je n'ai pas dit que c'était bête. Hein. Non, non. <rire> Moi, c'est bête, mais euh, je l'aime bien, mais euh, j'aime bien des choses bêtes. Donc, euh... ah, moi, je trouve ça magnifique, je trouve ça vraiment très, très beau, comme je te l'ai déjà dit. Non, non, c'est super intéressant, effectivement, parce que ça permet de comprendre le lien ah. entre euh, la partie euh, ODE et la partie, euh, la, la partie chaîne de Markov, qui est vraiment fondamentale et tu l'as très, très bien expliqué. Oui, euh, je, 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 je conseille fortement, fortement, fortement les, les papiers de Tom Kertz. Donc, euh, il y a vraiment une série de manuscrits. Euh, ce sont des titres qui sont très longs, mais c'est euh, évidemment, ils sont toujours euh, quelque chose sur le sujet. De, euh, dont le titre, c'est « Ration de EDO » et euh, « Density Dependent Population Processes euh, »,« Appellation euh, Central Limit Theorem ». Et c'est aussi Andrew Barber a aussi fait euh, pas mal euh, des les manuscrits, c'était euh, sur le même sujet, sur la même classe. Et euh, vraiment, ils ont, ils ont fait énormément de travail. Et euh, c'est euh, des choses que c'était intéressant pour moi. C'était, ils n'ont pas vraiment fait des choses à, à, vraiment à, à bord des de, de régions. Donc, c'est des choses qui manquaient. En fait, c'était les relations entre les branches, c'est des branchements. 
et euh, les EDO qui euh, on est en train d'ajouter à moi avec des collègues. En fait. oui. euh, Gabriel, tu avais une question euh, bon, donc, euh, Pardon, je suis en train de. Gabriel, oui. Gabriel, on ne t'entend pas. J'essaie comme ça, est-ce que vous m'entendez maintenant Oui, 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 oui. Okay. Euh, donc, c'était une question surtout sur le processus de passage à la limite, parce que là, effectivement, euh, à certains moments, donc, on voit le modèle SIR comme un passage à la limite, euh, mais il y a aussi le terme euh, Orstein-Nolembeck qui apparaît, n'est-ce pas euh, Oui. Est-ce qu'il ne peut pas être utilisé de certaines manières Parce que là, effectivement, peut-être que le, le « i » il est toujours trop grand. Mais voilà, est-ce que ce terme, il n'enseigne pas d'une manière ou d'une autre sur le... Oui, en fait, donc, je le cache un peu parce que donc, pour nous, c'est important quand j'ai dit qu'il faut... Je reviens, si je peux. J'aime bien toujours cacher des choses qui sont trop compliquées, donc... Euh, ici. Euh, ça rentre en fait donc euh, plutôt ah, voilà c'est juste ici que ça rentre en fait donc euh, le terme de Kertz original c est, c est, ça dit que les EDE sont euh, ils sont justes quand on a juste à seul temps euh, qui sont finis en fait donc il, il a vraiment à prendre une, une priorité qui est indépendante de n qui est fixée et ce euh, terme, c'est vraiment qu'on ne peut que euh, prendre des temps dans une, dans une euh, des temps compacts, en fait, euh, indépendant de n pour, euh, de pour, euh, les, pour faire euh, les SEDO. Et en fait, c'est les corrections de Nansen Olimba qui euh, permettent de faire que, pour dire que euh, en fait, euh, l'erreur qu'on prend ici, c'est toujours euh, petit par rapport à epsilon n. C'est ça qui, en fait, qui permet de, de passer. Euh, des temps qui sont euh, finis, des temps qui sont euh, à l'ordre de logarithme de n. Ok. Euh, Gabriel, euh, Olivier, tu as une question Oui, j'ai une question sur le, le birth and death process. Oui. Euh, slide 21. Quand on met des probabilités sur un graphe comme ça, euh, on fait la même chose en finance pour, pour étudier euh, l'évolution <coughs> euh, de certains produits de marché financiers. Euh, on, on peut passer à la limite. On montre qu'en fait, c'est une discrétisation par différence finie d'une certaine équation au dérivé euh, différentiel ou au dérivé partiel. Donc, euh, est-ce que quelqu'un a essayé de passer à la limite euh, sur les probabilités que tu as données sur ces branchements pour voir qu'est-ce que ça donne donc, pas, pas, pas la solution limite, l'équation. Donc, donc, toujours, on a les limites ici. Donc, je crois que c'est le processus de diffusion de Feller qui est la limite de ça, le processus de branchement de, qui arrive à une diffusion. En fait, c'est un peu à l'inverse pour moi parce que j'ai commencé quand j'ai fait ce travail-là. J'ai commencé vraiment avec des choses heuristiques et vraiment d'origine des analyses de diffusion par les méthodes que j'ai démontrées. Ah, pardon. Les méthodes de, de Poincaré et donc euh, de faire des approximations de l'EDO. Donc, euh, on peut faire la même chose avec les EDP et faire des approximations de boundary layer. Et on arrive, en fait, avec euh, les occasions pour euh, le processus de diffusion euh, qui est la limite de ce processus-là. Et, et en fait, on, on a trouvé, donc, euh, on arrive avec des choses qui sont plus exactes, euh, c'est plus correct et aussi plus facile euh, pour prouver des théorèmes avec le processus de branchement qui euh, en soi. Donc, c'est mieux en fait, pour nous de prendre le processus de branchement que son limite de fusion, en fait. Oui, d'accord. C'est moi, parce que je vais faire des choses. Donc, c'était une fois, j'étais là. Donc, voilà, donc, ceci, c'est un EDP qui décrit un processus de diffusion qui est un processus de diffusion de l'air. Et puis, c'était un regard en soi, j'ai dit, arrête, en fait, donc, ça, c'est un processus, c'est une limite d'un processus de branchement. Et si on prend le processus de branchement, qu'est-ce que ça donne Et peut-être ça marche à mieux. D'accord. D'autres questions euh, Peut-être euh, avant euh, que je fasse une autre question, je vais dire quelque chose aussi ici que j'aime bien avec le processus de branchement qui n'est pas possible, c'est beaucoup plus difficile avec les processus de fusion. 
c'est que il y a donc c'est seulement les versions les plus sont possibles d'un processus de branchement et donc à début j'ai dit donc je prends le temps quelqu'un est infecté c'est un processus c'est un temps exponentiel et ça c'est pas du vrai donc on, on, a, on peut prendre des données et c'est plutôt c'est on peut faire euh, ressemblance avec euh, des, des processus stochastiques pour le temps d'être infecté. Et ça marche très bien, mais c'est plutôt un processus, euh, euh, c'est pas un réel aléatoire euh, Weibull et pas un exponentiel. Et chose que j'aime bien avec les processus de branchement, on n'est pas obligé d'avoir, euh, pour décrire euh, ce temps-là, euh, pour avoir un processus de branchement Markovien, il faut que ceci c'est un, euh, un temps exponentiel, mais par contre, euh, avec un processus de branchement, on peut également prendre, une pro euh, en fait, on peut prendre euh, n'importe quelle euh, variable aléatoire euh, pour le temps ici. Et on, on a toujours euh, le moyen de faire une analyse du processus de branchement. C'est quelque chose que je suis en train de faire maintenant, donc euh, j'ai trop de choses à faire maintenant. Mais là, en essayant de passer d'un processus de branchement avec des temps exponentiels ici, mais plutôt avec quelque chose qui est une variable ici, pour avoir une, une approximation qui est plus juste. À, à la première partie de l'épidémie, en fait. Donc, ça montre vraiment des choses qui sont super avec les processus de branchement. Ok, très intéressant. Ok, autre question Mathieu, oui. Oui, bonjour Tad, et bonjour à tous et merci, merci pour l'exposé très très intéressant. Euh, pour, pour, juste pour rebondir déjà sur ce que tu viens de dire avant d'aller à ma question, en fait, tu. Euh, Peut-être qu'un un processus de branchement euh, age-dependent branching process, au lieu d'avoir des, des, des lois exponentielles, serait plus approprié pour des, 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 des épidémies ici, étant donné. Oui, oui, oui. okay. euh, J'avais une, une autre question sur la, les, les parties spatiales. En fait, c'est plus par rapport aux, aux données que tu nous as montrées. Tu nous as montré une, une image, je crois que c'était slide 8, euh, qui ah, concernait oui. deux îles. Et est-ce que dans cet exemple, l'intuition que j'ai eue quand tu en as parlé, mais peut-être c'est complètement faux, c'était qu'il y avait un effet spatial, c'est-à-dire que peut-être une des îles avait été beaucoup plus touchée que l'autre et le redépart de l'épidémie était dû au fait qu'on trouvait encore pas mal de susceptibles sur une des deux îles par rapport à l'autre et que ça avait permis le, le, le rebond ensuite. Et qu'ici, on pourrait envisager qu'il y, y a une sorte d'effet spatial qui joue et de manière plus générale, euh, on, on, on peut avoir l'impression que dans un modèle avec des, des clics un peu isolés qui sont reliés par des, par des liens assez faibles, on, on peut avoir des effets de redépart d'épidémie qui sont plus dus au fait que certaines clics voient moins l'épidémie la première fois et que du coup, si jamais elles sont atteintes par la suite, et ben là, ça redémarre véritablement. Euh, du coup, la, la dernière chose que je voulais te demander, c'est par exemple sur, sur, le, sur Measles, les, la, la rougeole c'est ça, euh, ça Oui, euh, sur la rougeole, il euh, y, y a cet effet un peu étrange d'une de, 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 épidémie tous les deux ans. Oui, c'est euh, la période d'avant. Oui. Et, et, et que euh, Olivier Gascoigne nous avait expliqué, je crois, la dernière fois, ou je ne sais plus si je l'ai entendu ailleurs, mais, mais qui était que euh, le, le, le fait est qu'il n'y avait pas une population assez grande dans, une, dans les écoles euh, la première année, qu'il fallait au moins deux générations pour, pour que ça démarre véritablement. Est-ce que les, les, les écarts de deux ans sont les mêmes aux différents endroits du monde Est-ce qu'il y a une alternance entre continents ou des choses comme ça C'est-à-dire, est-ce que c'est toujours les mêmes, euh, les mêmes années qu'on voit des, un pic de measles absolument partout dans le monde ou est-ce que c'est alterné Et dans ce cas-là, il y a l'effet spatial qui peut permettre de, de, de mieux comprendre cette alternance d'années entre les, entre les deux. J'arrête je, je, là. Et donc... Ok, donc pour, pour les vies, donc on, on sait bien que c'est donc avec euh, les euh, sur euh, les huit, donc c'est l'épidémie de, euh, de grippe. C'était vraiment, on, on est absolument sûr, que c'était pas en transmission entre les deux îles, donc, parce qu'on a vraiment vu la même trajectoire sur deux les deux îles. Donc euh, il, y a prise, euh, il y a presque un épuisement dans deux les deux îles. Il n'y a aucun contact et puis il y a une deuxième épidémie. C'est que je vois en fait, très souvent dans les dans les vraies données, donc euh, même dans une population complètement isolée, on, on voit ce phénomène, phénomène de une première épidémie, une deuxième, une troisième, et même si on a une population qui est uh, complètement isolée, c'est bon, uh, quelques individus qui restent. Uh, donc ça, c'est uh, pour ça. Donc uh, deuxième, donc uh, pour uh, rougeole. Oui, donc il y a, il y a plusieurs hypothèses. Uh, J'aime bien uh, celle de mon collègue parce que pour moi c'est c'est la masse jolie. Uh, 
euh, oui, c'est possible que c'est un effet spatial, c'est possible que c'est un effet, euh, un effet de, donc, de, de un période de gestion qui est deux ans. Mais par contre, euh, si on prend de... Euh, donc, euh, ils ont passé à ça parce que je conseille fortement euh, le manuscrit que c'est euh, ici. Euh, Jonathan Bouchard qui est mon collègue ce, pour ce projet-là. Donc, euh, David, aussi, euh, David Aronson, c'est aussi un auteur pour, sur ce manuscrit. Et bien, donc, ils ont vraiment commencé avec euh, un modèle de base, avec euh, le modèle SIR. Et ils ont dit, ok, ils ont, ils ont, ils ont vraiment épuisé toutes les hypothèses qu'ils ont, ils ont commencé. Donc, ok, on, on a toujours l'idée qu'il y a un euh, forcement qui qu est annuel qu à, cause, à cause des écoles. Et ça n'a pas, en fait, euh, c'était pas suffisant euh, au départ pour, faire, pour voir ce phénomène-là. Ils ont vraiment euh, passé plus, euh, beaucoup, beaucoup d'hypothèses. Et finalement, ils sont arrivés que, en fait, on, dans les occasions, ils ont vu que on peut vraiment avoir une. C'est ce phénomène-là qui est un genre de bifurcation, qu'on passe d'un cycle tous les ans, d'un cycle de tous les deux ans avec un forcing. Et c'est vrai, c'est que l'hypothèse. Il est toujours en dispute, c'est quelle est la cause, parce que c'est inconnu en ce moment-là. Donc, c'est donc une, une question qui est ouverte. Merci beaucoup pour la réponse. Et aussi, sur la question spéciale, en fait, donc, je dis aussi, donc, je n'ai pas parlé de ça aujourd'hui, mais en fait, on est aussi en train, en ce moment, de considérer les cas qu'on a une situation, qu'on a plusieurs populations qui sont connectées. En fait, c'est un travail qui, c'est un peu, c'est un peu le difficile, mettons, parce que pour nous, parce que, donc, on a commencé tous ces projets il y a quelques mois et l'année dernière. On a fait pas mal de progrès et puis euh, depuis quelques mois, je ne vois plus mes collègues parce qu'ils ont tous euh, au Canada. En fait, ils ont tout pris par euh, les gouvernements du Canada pour faire euh, des modélisations qui sont plus au point euh, pour euh, vraiment, des choses très très réalistes et euh, ils n'ont pas le temps pour faire euh, des choses plus théoriques maintenant. Mais euh, on a commencé vraiment à faire un modèle qu'on imagine qu'il y a plusieurs îles euh, qui sont connectées. Et on a considéré deux extrêmes, soit c'est une connexion qui est très très faible, qui veut dire qu'il y a très peu de gens qui, qui, qui passent de l'un à l'autre. Et l'autre possibilité, c'est de considérer la possibilité qu'il y a peut-être euh, plus, euh, plus comme le monde actuel, qu'il y a des gens qui bougent beaucoup, 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 euh, très vite. Et par contre, ils ont un droit de résidence, et puis, euh, mais par contre, ils bougent partout en avion. Et euh, en effet, donc c'est... On n'est pas encore fini, mais on a commencé à faire des estimations pour le temps entre. Euh, on regarde donc, il y a une euh, quand une infection de, euh, commence à un endroit, puis euh, le temps, le temps euh, pour, pour qu'il démarre dans un autre endroit, et puis le troisième et le quatrième. Et en fait, c'est intéressant parce que euh, le, notre objectif là, ce n'était pas plutôt pour prédire des choses, mais en fait, de faire plutôt euh, euh, ressemblance pour dire donc, OK, on peut prendre des données anciennes, euh, des épidémies dans le passé, et dire donc, on, on a vu qu'il euh, a démarré ici, euh, puis après, euh, ensuite, non, quelques semaines plus tard, c'était euh, là, puis là, puis là. Et prendre le temps entre le démarrage dans tout endroit pour reconstruire euh, le, le lien, euh, la puissance des liens entre les endroits euh, avec les données anciennes. Le, mais mettons, on, si je pose une question, c'est plus utile pour faire une projection dans le futur que par exemple, sur le passé. Merci. On va peut-être passer à une dernière question. Léo Oui. Euh, merci beaucoup pour l'exposé. C'est très clair. Est-ce que, est que tu pourrais revenir euh, sur le lien avec, euh, avec ton travail et puis le système d'équation différentielle stochastique du type ITO Alors, euh, ici, voilà. Et donc, euh, ça c'est... Donc, oui. OK. Attends, ma question, c'est quoi donc... Euh, donc, le... Ma question, c'est... Euh, donc, l'équation différentielle stochastique avec les mouvements browniens correspond bien exactement euh, au modèle de chaîne Markov qui a été présenté avant et est-ce que éventuellement peut faire, les simulations numériques sont, peuvent être faites avec, des, avec euh, en simulant le mouvement 
D'accord. Donc, d'abord, donc, ceci, c'est donc, euh, ceci, c'est c'est une recette. Ce c'est du slide. Ceci et les prochains. Donc, ils sont là pour dans le mail. C'est vraiment c'est une recette de passe euh, d'un système. Donc, euh, mettons ici, j'ai des tas, euh, des tas des événements euh, qui sont euh, qui dépendent sur, euh, toujours sur la densité et pas sur la, le nombre des individus. Et donc, on passe de, des tas de, des événements jusqu'à son quand ceci c'est une, une chambre vectorielle qui donne les EDO. Et puis, ceci c'est la recette de passe à l'EDO à la pro, à, ce n'est pas un processus de fusion direct, c'est en fait, une correction qui est... Euh, c'est ici, donc, donc c'est, c'est le processus, euh, donc ici, c'est le vrai processus stochastique. Ceci, c'est l'EDO et ceci, c'est une correction stochastique qui est donnée par ça. Il y a un deuxième euh, manuscrit par Kurt, enfin, un troisième, euh, c'est euh, uh, Strong Approximations, c'est euh, le titre. Uh, to density dependent population processes. Ils écrivent aussi un autre moyen d'arriver directement à un processus, uh, un, un EDS, uh, c'est qui est plus, plus uh, le moyen classique uh, qui les gens font avec une expansion uh, dans les séries uh, de Cajun Master. Et, mais il a dit donc qu'ils ont, donc c'est, ça c'est, c'est tout, tout le monde apparaît et celui-là donc uh, les différences entre les deux approximations c'est uh, l'autre uh, ln n sur n qu'on est grande. Et oui, on peut prendre les EDO, comme ça, c'est les S pour les simulations. Ça donne des corrections, mais c'est quelque chose que j'ai trouvé moi-même. C'est souvent que les EDO sont déjà assez pour les choses qu'on veut faire. Et par contre, oui, c'est utile aussi de voir des EDS. Par exemple, maintenant, je suis en train aussi avec les mêmes collègues pour estimer le temps que pour le maximum de l'infection, de l'épidémie. Et euh, dans ce cas-là, c'est vraiment c'est important de prendre ces corrections-là pour avoir une estimation de l'EDO, parce qu'on a une approximation qui est l'EDO qui n'est pas, euh, pas assez exact. Donc, on, c'est, c'est l'EDS qui va aider. Et par contre, euh, euh, des choses que j'ai, j'ai vraiment, je n'ai pas parlé beaucoup des EDS aujourd'hui, parce que même euh, quand on prend des corrections euh, EDS ou euh, ils sont, euh, des déductions, ils marchent très mal euh, vers le fond. Euh, donc, euh, quand on est très peu désinfecté, euh, bien sûr, ça marche mieux que les, ED, euh, les EDO, mais ce n'est c'est pas, c'est pas trop bien quand même pour décrire qu'on en est très peu des individus. Donc, euh, les processus de branchement, c'est vraiment beaucoup mieux à euh, part euh, de l'épidémie que euh, même euh, les EDS. Et donc, euh, mais par contre, ah oui, ils sont toujours euh, là, c'est donc, euh, euh, je, 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 c'est une recette pour qu'on puisse euh, aller directement du processus de Markov jusqu'à un EDS qui va donner une approximation qui est euh, une erreur de ordre, euh, comme je dis, euh, l'algorithme de n sur n, c'est la, l'erreur qu'on en est grande. Ok, merci. Il est 11 heures, je pense qu'on on, on va peut-être arrêter là. Si vous avez d'autres questions euh, ben, je vous invite à, à les poser à Todd. Le mieux serait d'utiliser le forum qui a été mis en place puisque ça permet à tout le monde d'avoir la, les questions et les réponses et, et d'enrichir comme ça notre connaissance. Euh, évidemment, vous pouvez poser des questions directement à Todd, mais euh, je répète, l'utilisation du forum serait à, à, à privilégier. Euh, on a les transparents, je vous les ai envoyés de, de Todd pour la suite euh, de l'exposé. Mais comme il est 11 heures, je pense qu'il vaut mieux arrêter là. Vous pouvez regarder, bien évidemment, les transparents et là aussi poser les questions. Je voulais terminer en, 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 en indiquant que la faculté des sciences a, a fait un, un appel sur la semaine là pour des projets dans le cadre de la, la modélisation du, du, du SARS. Donc, l'appel vient juste d'arriver. Euh, il, il, il y a une semaine pour les rédiger bien évidemment tout le monde est libre de le, de le faire indépendamment je pense que ça serait bien là aussi d'utiliser ce forum pour essayer de coordonner les demandes pour que s'il y a des demandes similaires elles soient jointes plutôt qu'elles soient antinomiques euh, et, et, et en opposition ça donnerait plus de force les, le soutien euh, est, est, est limité à 75 kilos euros, ce qui est quand même pas mal. Ça permet de, d'employer euh, des post-docs. Euh, je rappelle que euh, dans le cadre de l'Institut Carnot Smiles, j'ai mis 
euh, la, la possibilité d'utiliser du temps ingénieur pour essayer d'accélérer un certain nombre de, de simulations numériques. Une, il y a déjà une collaboration en place avec euh, Antoine Danchin et Gabriel Tourinic qui marche très bien. Euh, on pourrait augmenter ça. On peut aussi euh, avoir euh, des financements pour des stages. Il y a pas mal de stagiaires qui se retrouvent un petit peu le bec dans l'eau en ce moment parce que leur stage ne peut pas commencer et ça serait donc une bonne opportunité de leur proposer un stage dans le cadre du, du, du Covid. Et donc, on peut obtenir du financement dans ce cadre-là. Euh, il y a plein d'idées qui peuvent être lancées. Euh, les échelles peuvent aller du, du plus petit, c'est-à-dire de, de la simulation moléculaire avec des interactions entre le, le virus et la surface de la cellule, le déploiement de, de, de l'ARN à, à l'intérieur, la, la multiplication. Il peut y avoir aussi des choses sur… J'ai vu des publications qui parlaient de la possibilité du virus de s'attacher à des particules dans l'atmosphère. Bon, je n'y crois pas trop et ça n'a pas l'air d'être trop sûr, mais c'est aussi une échelle qui pourrait être regardée. Il y a des modèles de, de propagation, donc comme ce qu'on vient de voir, il y a des adaptations régionales eh, qui seraient intéressantes de regarder, comme on avait pu le, le voir dans l'un dans le, dans, 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 dans des premiers exposés. Il peut y avoir des modèles d'évolution du virus, il peut y avoir des modèles d'interaction virus haute, donc ça, ce sont des, des pistes qui peuvent être lancées. Euh, voilà, donc il y a il y a, je ne sais pas combien a été mis en place mais, par la faculté des sciences, mais si c'est pareil que pour la faculté de médecine, c'est euh, 500 kilos euros qui, qui, qui sont proposés pour financer donc, très rapidement des projets. On a une semaine pour répondre, hein, puisque la réponse doit être donnée pour lundi prochain. Euh, et donc, euh, je, je propose que ceux qui n'ont pas encore utilisé le forum l'utilisent. Je vais transformer... La, la, la file euh, qui s'appelait ANR, euh, on va l'appeler, on, on va la, 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 la dénommer ANR et on va l'appeler euh, euh, projet à, 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 à déposer. Et donc, ça serait bien que vous utilisiez ce, ce mode-là pour savoir qui est intéressé. Si vous lancez une piste, essayez de coordonner les pistes. Voilà. Euh, donc, la prochaine réunion, ça va être jeudi ou vendredi. Euh, je ne sais pas trop encore, il y, y, y a plusieurs possibilités, en particulier j'ai demandé à Jocelyn Garnier de nous faire un, un exposé, vous avez sans doute vu que Jocelyn avait été interviewé sur, sur une chaîne euh, puisqu'il s'est aperçu dans son, un calcul de sensibilité qu'il euh, y avait une très très grande variation dans, le, dans, dans les données et que ça pouvait mener à des à des conclusions totalement différentes. Euh, on, on, on a vu le, le bêta ici, euh, euh, le, les facteurs bêta, les facteurs gamma. Donc, tout ça, ce sont des facteurs euh, dont la, la, la précision importe pour savoir comment va, va évoluer et en particulier euh, l'importance des porteurs sains. Euh, donc, euh, la, le petit jeu auquel Jocelyn s'est mené d'être interviewé euh, sur LCI, je crois, a fait qu'il euh, il a réussi à, à convaincre euh, le gouvernement de lancer une, une, une analyse pour essayer d'avoir une idée du nombre de porteurs saints, ce qui me semble, ce qui me semble intéressant et ce qu'on qu pourrait aussi essayer de développer dans le cadre de ce forum et dans le cadre de cet appel d'offres. Voilà, donc je dis peut-être que Jocelyn sera disponible, comme il a encore des enseignements à faire, dont un grand amphi avec devant 500 polytechniciens. Il n'est pas sûr d'avoir le temps, mais en tout cas, euh, il va confirmer aujourd'hui ou demain euh, un, un exposé, euh, un exposé je, jeudi éventuel. Vendredi, on pourra en avoir un autre et la semaine prochaine, ça continue. Voilà, très bien. Donc, euh, utilisez le forum pour continuer les discussions. Et euh, je vous dis à très bientôt euh, sur, euh, sur cette chaîne Zoom et aussi sur le forum. À bientôt, au revoir. Merci. Merci en tout cas encore à Todd pour ce, ce superbe exposé qui nous a permis, euh, en tout cas à moi, pauvre déterministe, d'avoir une compréhension un peu plus grande sur euh, la, la, les, les, les modèles aléatoires. Merci, au revoir. Merci, au revoir. Au revoir.